Okay, great souls. I'm not going to say, do you have any questions from the last time? Because the last time being six weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> we are now on class number 66. We are on page number 171. We are on sutra number 418. There are, you see the barn door. There are 177 pages. There are four, there are 34 434 from 418. Do you think we can get there in three classes? We are going to try. No. At the end, basically, on the last class, nobody goes home till we finish. <laughs> That's what I was just sitting there. That's what I just figured out. We will just, we'll just keep going until we're done. At the end, Swami hardly makes any comments, so probably we can just read through and call it a wrap. So, we're on 419. No, excuse me, 418. Okay. Everybody ready? 418. Because the Atman is unchangeable, the vrittis of chitta are always known to it. Because the Atman is unchangeable, the vrittis of chitta are always known to it. When you stand on a riverbank, you can observe clearly the whirls and eddies in the flowing water beneath you. If you were caught in one of those little vortices, however, your perception would become distorted. That is so simple, isn't it? From the outside you can see it, from the inside, whoa, and from the inside we become, the part of the distortion is we become persuaded, finally we are seeing things clearly. <laughs> That's the horrible joke of it. Only when the primordial feelings, he's given us this word primordial, I don't know if it's been there before, only when the primordial feelings are not agitated by desires and attachments, can you perceive anything in life clearly? What does primordial mean? Can someone define it, Tricia? Original, original, fundamental? As far back as it goes? The ground from which everything else comes out, out of. Excellent. I thought that's what it meant, but I needed to hear it just right. Only when the primordial feelings are not agitated, which is only when the fundamental source is not, which is our true self, not agitated by desires and attachments, can you perceive anything in life clearly? I mean, it's, that's just pretty total, isn't it? Only when you're not agitated by desires and attachments can you, see, can you perceive anything clearly. I mean, what that's telling us is we never have a clue what's really going on around us, do we? We have just this wildly subjective experience of life. I, 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 um, I've always sort of known this, but not really. You know, the difference between being able to read it and say, yes, that's true, and actually observing. Um, I was telling uh, someone, uh, I had this experience which was so vivid and it was so real. Um, as some of you may know, I, work, I, I, I worked on the school plays for a number of years. Actually, I think I almost did five plays. It seems like it was a long time, maybe four and a half. And I did the costumes for the plays and it took me six weeks of intense work. I absolutely loved doing it. I became totally obsessive and engaged to such an extent that it was my, the center of my universe. And every tiny nuance of working on it was just like so important to me. And when I figured out, for example, how to tie together the overcloak with the white blouse by putting a little bit of a trim here and a little trim here. I mean, to me it was such a significant and meaningful experience that I imposed that on everybody. All conversation during those weeks, when if you were with me, I would just wait for an opening and then I would describe <laughs> the, king's, the king's crown, you know, the trousers that I'd worked out, just anything. And I just thought that was entertaining conversation. My friends did not agree. It became, well, Trisha agreed. Trisha agreed because she is like me, but almost no one else did. Let's just, it was just we few, we enlightened few. So one day at one of our Tuesday satsangs, people started teasing me because they, they were also getting kind of tired of this. They started teasing me. It was in the middle of the play season and there was a good natured ribbing that went on for some minutes where they were all explaining to me how profoundly uninterested they were in the entire subject. And despite my enthusiasm, it really was utterly meaningless to them. And they, everybody being very clever, they all chimed in. And I took it in the right spirit. It wasn't 
None of it was mean-hearted. It was just fun. So we all laughed about my obsession and so on and so on like that. When it finally went silent again, this is what happened to me. My subconscious mind registered that they were all talking about costumes. And I opened my mouth to tell them some meaningful detail about the costumes. <laughs> but before I could actually say it, it occurred to me that I'd misread the situation to slightly. <laughs> but I was totally there. I was totally there that all I'd, all I'd picked out of that whole conversation was the part that suited me, that fit my desires. And I was just going to run right into it, except that some little bit of me caught itself. But how many times have you talked to people? Or, you know, I was talking to someone not too long ago about a, 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 a meeting situation in which decision was made not to do something. And then the person went and did exactly what was decided not to be done and was completely unaware of the decision that they had made. But I know what happened. Just emotionally predisposed, he merely heard the subject and did not hear the actual content and just carried away the fact that we had all talked about it. Now, you might think that's ridiculous. I would have thought it too, except it happened to me right there. But I just was astute enough to catch it before it went on. Isn't that amazing? So there we are. You know, how much of, I mean, I've been in many situations. That Swami used to often have me sit with people when he would talk to them. And I remember this man who was just, bent on doing this project that Swami knew would be a disaster for him and told it when it would be a disaster. And furthermore said to him, this is not spiritually necessary for you. You do not need to become skillful in this particular area. It's not your strong suit and you don't need it spiritually. Just go here instead. The man walked out, went right the direction that Swami told him not to go. It just ended very badly. Much later, I said to him, well, remember what Swami said to you? Total. Had not heard it at all. I mean, it wasn't even subtle. It wasn't even one of those things that I've been in where Swami would hint. This was absolutely explicit. But it wasn't wanted. Because only when the primordial feeling is absolutely calm do we ever actually see things clearly. Now, don't get too depressed. I mean, we're just, we're no different than anyone else. But, but, but one should be extremely um, attentive when you are, especially when you're contradicted. When somebody contradicts your perception of things rather than intensely defending your perception of things, it, it's a good idea, at least in that moment, if you can, if the primordial feeling is calm enough for you to be able to just stop and actually become interested in what other people perceive. Now, this is where the... Excuse me, I think I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> Just once. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yes, I would love a tissue. This is also, though, <clears throat> where life becomes just intensely entertaining in the sense of how differently people can perceive exactly the same situation. And just, and how, how sincerely good people can see. I mean, I've had, <coughs> um, and a really interesting example when the primordial feeling was not so calm was when we were going through the litigation, all those years of litigation. We had a legal team of eight or nine people. <coughs> we were often all in the same meetings, everything. But uh, I remember just once saying to someone, oh, you remember that day when all these critical things happened? The person said, what day? <laughs> what critical things? And perfectly. It wasn't, you know, I can't really say that my perception was accurate. It's just that my perception was different. Because being who I am, I'm attuned to certain vibrations, and those are the vibrations I catch. And in the same way, I know in my life I've done things that had impacts on people, that I was just completely unaware of. And yet other people in the room saw them perfectly. How could she ever think that was a good thing to say? What? Huh? Oh, you know? It's like, just made perfect sense to me. So there's a multitude of applications of this. 
You know, one is to be very humble about one's own point of view and very attentive to listen to others. The other is to not be swayed too easily by other people's opinions. <laughs> because, as Swami said, they're almost always wrong because they also are just coming from whatever the orientation is. But also to bear in mind that whatever we have until we're free is simply our orientation. It may, in fact, be the right one for us. It may be the only one for us. At the time, I remember a friend of mine who was doing something quite controversial told him that God told him to do it. I said, well, because a lot of people are going to disagree with you, (laughs) maybe you should say, I felt that God inspired me. Or, you know, just like, let's just tone it down a bit so that it's not everybody versus God. How about that? You know? Even if you do feel certain in yourself. You know, Swamiji was always very careful. No matter how certain he was of his intuition, he tended always to express it very tentatively for a number of reasons. One was humility. And, and um, let me phrase it, and appropriate concern for his own capacity to be wrong. The other was because it was so possible that other people would hold strongly different points of view. <clears throat> he wanted to give them the karmic freedom to have those different points of view and to come to understanding at their own pace and not merely be oppressed by his certainty. And so that's yet another reason why, <clears throat> even if we feel very strongly about something, we need to say it in such a way that other people have the opportunity to come to it on their own. Because one, if they only come to it because you forced it on them, several things will happen. As soon as they get a chance, they will rebel against you like crazy. Or as soon as somebody else strong, stronger comes along, they will just simply switch without ever having a position of their own. So among the other things that we see clearly when the primor- primordial feeling is calm enough is that we actually know how to be helpful to each other. Because so often, under the guise of helping each other, we are actually doing nothing except being ourselves and making ourselves feel better um, temporarily. So, because the Atman is unchangeable, the vrittis of chitta are always known to it. So here's the good news, which is there is a perspective from which clarity can be seen. I mean, when you think about Swami Kriyananda's life, you know, he just, he exemplifies, he, 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 was, he was the walking textbook. He, he was the walking, uh, what do you say, word problem. <laughs> you know, he, he demonstrated, he was the diagram of everything that's in this book. Because he was just so capable of perceiving things from the divine level. And, and so not agitated by needing to make things any different than they were. Desires and attachments, not agitated by desires and attachments. I mean, it's just, we have to just exhale and realize that, you know, it's, it's, we can say, oh, I'm not attached. People often say that. I'm not attached. I just want anything that happens here. Except they'll usually say it like this. I'm not attached. I just want anything that happens. I mean, with, in a voice that is so full of tension that, you know, if you're really not attached, you don't have to assert it so strongly. It just, you're just not. You just listen attentively. But that doesn't mean we can't also be directionally correct. And so that's why it's a very interesting balance because, and this is all through other parts of these sutras, we've read them all. You know, you have to have your perceptions and you have to have the courage to stand by them. And Swamiji would give people advice lots of times. If you think you're right, don't give in. (laughs) Rather than tell people, you know, well, if the whole committee thinks that it should be differently then just go along. I mean, I, he has said there are times when you know, your opinion just doesn't matter. Cooperation is what matters. But on many occasions, I heard him say, if you feel strongly and you really think you're right, don't give in. I mean, he didn't mean to assert yourself in a way that was ugly, but be loyal to your own perceptions and have the courage of your convictions. As he put it to me, though, which is important to remember, truth doesn't need you to defend it. It will speak for itself. And so if you've presented your truth and you've been ignored, then there you are. But that doesn't mean you have to give in. Swami himself, speaking of his life in SRF, from which he was ejected, he said he was a little frustrating, more than a little. He was very frustrating to work with. 
because um, if he thought he was right, he wouldn't give in. He wouldn't be, he wouldn't be disobedient. You know, he wouldn't say, I'm just not going to do what you say because I think I'm right. But he wouldn't give in either. He would just find a way to quietly hold his position and wait for the appropriate opportunity to present it again or to utilize it in a different context. But he said I mean, he was sure it was quite frustrating for the others because he just was that kind of person. But we have to balance these. And humility is the answer. And humility is self-honesty. And not self-honesty. It says, well, I may be motivated by ego or, you know, I may, I may not always be right, but I can't think of a time when I wasn't the kind of energy. <laughs> or as people say, this is absolutely without ego. I'm just saying this absolutely without ego. <laughs> I think if it occurs to you to say that, then you really can't say that. But you can say, thinking of it as sincerely as I can, this is how it feels to me. But, given the primordial feeling, but then think how nice that is to go toward that ultimate calmness and to know that the the good old Atman is out there waiting (laughs) and always knows. (laughs) And just once we get there, that's everything. You know know the man at Ananda Village, Atman, uh, Peter Goring, Who's, he's about six and a half feet tall. He's a very tall man. And when we were doing the processional for the Moksha Mandir, they, they spaced it out. They wanted us to be about six and a half feet apart, and they called it one Atman, <laughs> like that. But I was not listening really carefully. Yeah, they kept saying one Atman apart, or a half an Atman. And, but when I heard it, I wasn't listening very carefully. And I kept thinking of the Atman, and I, all I could think of was they wanted us to be right on top of each other because the Atman takes up no space. And when I watched people walking and they were so far apart, I thought, how could that be one Atman apart? You know? <laughs> totally confusing. But finally it all straightened itself out. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, again, the mind just goes off. And, yeah, no, it was a measurement that was created because if he'd lain down, that was exactly the right space. One Atman, two Atmans. <laughs> All right, so is that, shall we go on? Okay, number 419. Now, those of you, you can look at your book. If it was published by Ananda Sangha Publications, in other words, if it's an Indian edition, then this sutra has been edited. If you have the American edition, then you have the correct writing in it. So, so those of you who have the Indian one, like I do, and Tom reminded me that when we started this class 66 classes ago, I brought back books from India because it wasn't yet published in America. So rather than you're trying to take it down now, you can just go into the bookstore and copy it. It's an extra paragraph. But the sutra itself has an extra phrase. So 419 says, not that it helps us that much to understand it, but we'll, we'll work on it. The mind is not self-luminous, for it is perceptible from without. The mind is not self-luminous, for it is perceptible from without. And then Swami wrote two lines in the Indian edition, but he wrote a whole paragraph later. So what he wrote is, the knowledge that we exist comes to us from within, but awareness that we think is perceivable to others. Okay, the knowledge that we exist comes to us from within, but awareness that we think is perceivable to others. Therefore, therefore, The thinking mind is not self-luminous. Our thoughts are not our own, but are rooted in the infinite. According to the level of consciousness on which we live, the thoughts we attract to us will be coarse, refined, or somewhere in between. Our level of consciousness depends on where our energy is centered in the spine. Okay, self-luminous presumably means... um, activated from within ourselves. The distinction he's making here is that our actual existence is divine and comes to us from the divine and is inherent. We can exist without thinking, and when we start thinking, it's entering into us. It's not fundamental to our nature because thoughts can go away and existence is still there, and we can be conscious of our existence even without thoughts. So that the thoughts, and he uses this, are perceptible to others. You know, you can look at someone and see that they're thinking. I can't parse it apart too completely. 
But then he adds to this, our thoughts are not our own, but are rooted in the infinite. According to the level of consciousness on which we live, the thoughts we attract to us will be coarse, refined, or somewhere in between. Our level of consciousness is determined by the energy in the spine. We, we're so habituated to observing our thoughts and thinking that they're us, and our thoughts just vary so wildly, you know, from, you know, from happy and free to confused and bound, from clear to um, muddied. And what he, he traces the whole thing back. They're not inherent. Inherent is the Atman, which is completely um, the primordial feeling that can always observe things clearly. And then the energy goes up and down the spine and wherever it's, it is, so to speak, it's vibrating. And then it just pulls out of the infinite a vibration that matches it. And then, then that vibration ex expresses itself to us as the thoughts that we think. Wow. Yeah, it just takes the whole story and puts it all into Kriya Yoga, doesn't it? And into keeping your consciousness at the spiritual eye, into magnetism. It's just so different. The whole universe is so different than the way we habitually move through it. Very challenging, but uh, Chandra and I were talking when we were walking over here, just some different ideas, but she was commenting about how exhilarating it is to see how simple it is, really, in the end. And I, I was commenting to her that the longer you're on the path, the more often you realize how simple this is. Whereas at the beginning, it seems so complicated. And it is, it, it's made complicated because of the vrittis. We can't see things clearly. And so we start thinking about this and then this comes in and that comes in and we get confused by this and confused by that. But gradually, we, we exist. We know that we exist. Our thoughts come, come to us from outside of ourselves and they are magnetized by where the energy is in the spine, which takes you back to control the energy in the spine. Everything else follows. Um, Swami Shankarananda, who's a, a Kriya Yoga lineage through Sri Yukteswar, and he has an ashram in Rishikesh. He was visiting Ananda village, and he gave a satsang on Kriya, which I thought was a nice and interesting topic, but you're not kind of a tricky thing to go into an ashram as well-educated as Ananda and talk about Kriya. But he gave a fabulous satsang. I mean, he, he's a very fine man, and he was very attuned, he just talked about breath. And it was, I can't quote to you much of what he said um, because I, I just didn't remember it on that level. But it was so interesting because, of course, breath is tied to consciousness. And breath is actually the physical manifestation of the energies flowing up and down the spine. And so when you are in right relationship to breath, that's all you have to do. Everything else follows from that. Everything else follows. And what is it, the single thing that we always have? Breath. Until we transcend it, of course, but by then we don't need to be instructed. But we always have our breath. All we have to do is have our breath be appropriate, conscious, centered, um, be in the breath with the awareness of it as the doorway into the spine. The energy in the spine is then where it needs to be then our magnetism is correct, then we attract the thoughts on the level that we want, and there we are. Easy? No, I didn't say it was easy. Simple? Yes. And the distinction is a vitally important spiritual distinction. Because when we think it's complicated, we distract ourselves endlessly with uh, ramifications of that complexity, imagining that if we can just get all that sorted out, then it will actually make our consciousness different. But actually sorting it out is to realize that we don't have to sort it out. Now, don't misunderstand me. To be spiritually well-educated is very useful. But that's different than just endlessly spinning theories. And that's what I love so much about Swami Kriyananda's writing. Never an extra word. Every word contributes to a deeper understanding of whatever you're trying to learn. And for that reason, his writing is challenging. You know, there's a lot of times when I think I'll read something easier. <laughs> Here, here's a nice biography of St. Bernadette of Lourdes. That looks like more fun tonight than the Gita commentary. <laughs> but still, you understand? Questions or comments? I 
Oh. <laughs> Atma Jyoti's only comment is this bears this bears repeating. <laughs> okay, were you going to say something or just having the mic? Okay, Tom has a question. We've missed you, Tom. Okay. So I wanted to ask if you were just talking about um, <clears throat> where your energy is in the spine attracts the appropriate, the uh, according thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then could you say, then that is your experience of life? The thoughts that you have? Yeah. No, because life is also your Atman consciousness, your deeper soul consciousness too. Your thoughts are just, you can have, you can be having, I mean, think about when you meditate. Yeah. You can be having a very focused and very deep meditation and you still have, you can still have a, a background noise of thoughts. And you can be conscious of those thoughts and simultaneously conscious of a plane that is completely outside of those thoughts. Thoughts is just one dimension of who and what you are. And you can also watch, see that your thoughts are a little wacky and, and even be, find them a little out of your control but simultaneously exist somewhere else. So by no means. Well, okay. I was thinking a little bit more along the lines of when I'm just going through my everyday, my activities, my work, my relationships. Mm -hmm. um, okay, then what's the, what is the relationship between, uh, the, you know, where my energy is in the spine, I'm going to be attracting thoughts relative to that. Then doesn't that have some, what's the relationship between that and what's happening outside of me? Or is there, is there a cause and effect there? Or is, that, is this one of those questions that's just useless? Well, our thoughts definitely influence. Yeah. They create a magnetism of their own. I mean, our thoughts, our thoughts, um, what's the word? Re, you know, amplify. Our thoughts amplify the vibrations that we have, and we intensify them, and then that intensifies, and it intensifies. Yeah, and, yeah the power of thought. Yeah. So if we have very refined thoughts, very powerful, very directed thoughts, yeah, the power of thought's enormous to create magnetism, to... And plus, if we are having the right kind of thoughts in the right way, then it attracts more of those same thoughts to us. Because, you know, we are not meditating yogis in the Himalayas. We're extremely active in this world. And so we want, it's not that we can live without thought. To live without thought is to put us in a different um, karmic condition than the karmic condition we're in. So what we're really looking for is to have the right thoughts and to be inspired with the right thoughts. Artistically, creatively, in relationships, everything. How, Swami often mentioned how many times somebody asks him a question, he says, I don't know. And as soon as he says, I don't know, then the, the thought comes to him of exactly what he, do, he should know. Because his vibration is correct. Yeah, um, Chandra's waving her arm in the back there. You'll have to pass the mic. I was just imagining Master with a consciousness... I mean, a perfect consciousness, mm -hmm. walking, and it's, and it's raining all around him, except right where he is, it's sunny. Mm -hmm. um, Be okay. because, because he doesn't attract. I, I'm not sure that that would be the power of thought so much as just the fact that he's in charge of the whole dream. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, there's truth in that. The quality of your thoughts can create an atmosphere around you that will make your, you know, you'll, you'll be spared from disasters and... I mean, I don't know if it could, you could not get wet, but I imagine you could not get wet. <laughs> yeah, there, or, there, or there could be fighting all around you or something, fighting, and, 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 and you can just walk kind of right through well, it. Swami talks about when he was a, a college student and, he, and his, his uh, roommate had commotion karma and, always, and had kind of a persecution complex and was a little bit negative toward everyone, and he was always having adventures, you know, you know, Muggers would chase him, people would pull a gun on him, he would be attacked by someone who thought he would, had insulted them. And once he came in and said that he was being chased by some gang, and Swami thought, that sounds exciting, and ran outside, perfect peace, as Swami put it. <laughs> and then once he was, Swamiji was invited to uh, ride along in a patrol car on the night patrol, and the policeman just took him everywhere that there was always 
something happening, and there was not one incident that entire time. As long as Swami was in the car, not, none, none of the dependable areas could be relied upon to give him any action, as if Swami cared. But it just wasn't there. When Swami's father insisted on taking him fishing, or somebody took him fishing, you know, Swami just prayed, let there be no fish. <laughs> you know, he just didn't want to kill the little things or shoot the rabbits, you know, it just, whatever it was, it wouldn't be there. When he was playing bridge, and they were playing a penny a point, and Swami didn't want to gamble. I don't understand the workings of bridge, but he said it somehow his score came out to be an absolute zero, which I guess is very difficult, but it just, he was saved because he didn't want to have to participate and he didn't want to insult his host, which was his parents in this case, by being, you know, too, to their minds, absurdly moralistic about it. But he also didn't want to engage. So it just all comes out in the end. Your vibration is right, everything is right. That's, you know, that's why. Breathe. Be in right relationship to your breath and everything else will follow from that. And it's really true. I mean, think about it. What your breath is reflection of your consciousness. Whenever your consciousness is agitated, watch your breath. Calm your breath, calm your consciousness, calm your thoughts, calm your universe. Back to the simple. simple. I remember when I realized you can't breathe evenly and deeply and cry at the same time. So I was upset and I was crying. So I breathed evenly and deeply and then I decided I really wanted to cry. (laughs) I didn't want to not cry. I didn't enjoy not crying. So I just stopped breathing evenly and deeply. Just let the riti sweep me away. Not the smartest decision, but there you are. It, was, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but the relationship was just absolutely, there it was. Take care of your breath, and all these emotions are going to go away. But I was in the mood for the emotions, which a lot of times we are, because once they get you, they're interesting, or something, there's something about them, even though it's not smart. They still... Yes. So Delusion has its own power. That's the word. Yes, Marmarty. Some of the techniques that we use on this path to use thoughts, use mm-hmm. the mind, affirmation, mm-hmm. you know, other things. We get at it from but, that side, too. We go at it from that side. Uh-huh. But, the, but the thoughts, we're talking about the thoughts being magnetized to us by the energy in the spine. Right. So, and you, you said something about thoughts amplifying. So thoughts are they, amplify, right. So they're just like a tool, like an amplifier. I mean, why wouldn't we just think only about the energy in the spine drawing everything that we need instead of having to go through thought or going through some other... Uh, Why don't you try it and see if you can hold your mind there? That's why. It's because mostly it's too abstract. Right? If, If the energy that's there, whether we can control the energy in our spine or not, it's going to pull the thought and that's what's going to... But if you choose the right thought and use your willpower to choose the right thought, the act of using your willpower to choose the right thought will lift your energy in the spine. But that's why affirmations are not magic. If you do affirmations without, you know, it, it, you, can't, you can't just do them without concentration. They will have no effect. They're not a magic formula. They will have an effect if you use it as a way to focus your energy and focus it in the right way with your attention at the right place, and therefore you're pulling your energy up, you're concentrating on the words, so it's a way of accessing the inner energy. But it doesn't mean anything unless you do it in such a way that you actually shift the inner energy. And this is, this is a mistake. I'll just, this is a pet peeve of mine just while we're here. Hee <laughs> I get to use it. This is the power of the microphone. Okay. Uh, we often do, in small groups, we do prayers where people offer names into the prayers. And no matter how many times I have suggested that people say the names loudly and clearly and pause between so that we can send energy, people will go, it's not magic. If we can't hear it and nobody can concentrate on it, merely mumbling it into the room will not create anything. It's just not true. It's, it's an actual method where we present a name and people hear the name and even if they don't know the person, they know what we're concentrating on. We all concentrate and then we go on. But invariably, people just start mumbling them under their breath, which I suppose is good for them because they're at least thinking of it. But it's not magic. 
And if affirmation's the same way, it's probably better to even be doing it thoughtlessly than not at all. But the power of the result is exactly proportional to the power you put into it. It's just, it's metaphysics, it's not magic. The difference, is that helpful? And all the things like that are just because there, it's easier to start with something we can grasp. You can say your affirmation out loud and it brings your attention to a focus. When your attention comes to a focus on a refined idea, there's a corresponding shift in the energy. So you think the, the helpful thing I was looking for in what you said is that it's the will, it's mm-hmm. not the thoughts, it's the will that yeah. Yeah. affects the energy in the spine, which then uses, I mean, and as a result of that, we have the thoughts. Well, because also what happens when you, it's, it's the willpower you apply to the thought, is the way to say it. In, in the same way, if you apply your willpower to the affirmation, you begin to attract yourself a deeper and deeper understanding of that affirmation, which is to say that your consciousness begins to shift and therefore you perceive it on a more subtle level. And, and all of those things are the ways in which the affirmation actually affects you. So you think of it as a kind of a snowball because yeah. the thoughts are coming back and amplifying what's exactly. in the spine. Then the, the kick start, I mean, the place you start is the will. Yeah, so the will is, that's why the greater the will, the greater the flow of energy. That's why the energization exercises. Um, that's why also in, in affirmations that it's important that you have a solid connection to that affirmation, as I've talked about when I've talked about these, where you don't affirm beyond what you can actually reach, or you phrase it in such a way that you're, you don't reject it at the same time that you ask for it. Because <clears throat> if you do, you actually can weaken yourself. I am one with the infinite. Everything I do is perfect. Everything that happens, I know is just right. And your subconscious mind says, who are you kidding? You know you're a chicken-hearted little person, and I hope God isn't really listening. I mean, because part of you, but you can say, you know, with God's help, I will face whatever comes. And, and you can believe that. And so you can affirm that, and then you'll begin to feel that how God will help you, and I can face it, instead of just declaring a reality that is just too far from where you are for you to actually match it with your willpower. So the selection of affirmations is very important. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, Over here, Heidi has a question. I was thinking of... I was really appreciating the reminder of breath because occasionally for me, you know, it can seem out of the blue. I can be gripped by a level of anxiety that... You know, first I'll just kind of notice it in my thoughts. And depending on how it affects me, um, you know, then I'll have the awareness, wow, my breath is shallow. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And sometimes the awareness isn't enough to change the thought or the breath. But if I have the awareness, I can choose a tool. Exactly. I can say, okay, so what could help me shift that? You know, and it can become do a class, read some of the literature, take yoga. Like there's these different things right. that, and for me, sometimes it's gradual, you know, yeah. but just, it's just such a good reminder of, okay, that's right. Choose something. The breath is, there is something very tangible. I do find it a little bit easier to work with that, you know, um, depending. It just depends on. Yeah, depends on where my consciousness is. But sometimes, you know, just in the midst of that, wow, I'm in a consciousness I don't want to be in, you know, it's not enough to just say that to myself. Yeah, of, I, that's exactly true. I, I'm, I've been swimming for exercise for something over 20 years now, and it, I do it because it's good for my health. But I really got into it originally because it, I realized it was really good for my mind. And I swim with a snorkel because I've never been good at this. But what I like about swimming with the snorkel is the breath is constant. And I find that when I found, it's, I don't, it's not, I'm not in the same state that I was 20 some years ago when I started, but I had m- much more difficulty with anxiety at that time. And I found that if I, at the first sign of that tension building in me, if I threw myself in the swimming pool and just went back and forth with that snorkel, by the time I came out, I, I broke 
I broke it physiologically. Just as simple as that. I broke it physiologically, then it was easier to get above it. I mean, that's what exercise does, and a lot of the reason it does it is because of what it does to the breath. And that was, you know, when I was talking about crying and joking about holding it. But I did find if I was inclined to feel emotional, if I just went out for a brisk walk, the same thing, just get yourself breathing rhythmically, then all of a sudden new thoughts come to you. The thoughts that were making you feel so distressed, you're not having them as much anymore because you can't with that, if that breath is different. And these are very, 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 very useful um, arrows to have in our quiver because most of us can't just go like that. Swami tells the story in the path about being caught by a mood, trying to talk himself out of it, but then just going to his meditation room, putting his consciousness very strongly at the spiritual eye and being able to shift his consciousness, then the mood shifted, the mood vaporized, in fact. So direct is really great if it works for you. you know. And just to know, I'll go, sometimes you can't meditate perhaps, but you can chant, or you can do maha mudra, you can energize, you know, just, rec- but recognizing that that is the antidote. The antidote isn't to analyze because delusion has its own attractive power. And part of what it tells you is that you have to relate to it. This is how Swami put it once. It tells you that it's necessary to do this. There was a man who used to often talk about, had a lot of stuff to process, he would say, quite a lot of time. So, you know, I have a lot of stuff to process. One day Swami just looked at me and said, what is he talking about? (laughs) You know, I mean, he knew, but he was also just making the point. Stuff to process. And it's like, what's stuff to process? I mean, I'm not, because we often do have stuff to process. What can I say? But we do because we're vibrating on the level of stuff and on the vibration where it needs processing. Whereas instead, and even if we have to find some compromise in the middle, don't ever think that the direct approach of changing your consciousness isn't the the best option. And if you can't take it, then you, you retreat a little bit. But even if you're retreating from it, recognize that that's still what you're doing. It's not like all this other stuff is really important in itself. It just may be the necessary bridge till you can get back to. I remember, and you've heard me talk about this woman who was at Ananda for a while, short, short time, as you'll hear from this story. And Swamiji you know, gave her a lot of energy. She had a lot of promise. She was there for a short time, but after a while she stopped um, accepting invitations to have satsang with Swami. And this was exactly why. Because when she was with him, she couldn't remember her problems. And she felt it was important for her to work on her problems. And so she didn't like to be with him because then she couldn't remember them. And it, she didn't cross, you know, she didn't make the link. You know, so she was concerned because she wasn't processing her stuff. Because she was transcending it. It was just offering her a way out of it completely. But delusion has its own attractive power. This is not suppression. This is not denial. This is not lack of courage. This is perfectly willing to deal with it. And here's a better way to deal with it. I'll just shift my vibration. And then you, you'll, 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 you'll yo-yo. That's what I've observed. You yo-yo. I mean, I'm sure you've all had that. You're, you're dealing with something. And you have this meditation, you have this insight, and it's just like, how could that ever have bothered me? And then you just go on thinking, I'm done. And then, (laughs) and you're not. Whoa, isn't that interesting? And then, I'm done. It's just, you just kind of ride the waves and just keep holding on to the, but but having been there once or twice, you, you don't get, it's different when you go down again, because you can remember that I didn't always feel like this. You know, this too shall pass. Let nothing disturb you, nothing affright you. All things will pass, but God changes not. Patient endurance brings us to victory. Once you have God, you want nothing more. God alone. (laughs) And on and on. But you know, that's a great chant. It's a fantastic chant. Because it also tells you patient endurance brings you to victory. It's worth singing that one a lot. Yeah, like, how about, like, all the time? Okay. That was Teresa Vavila. She was a smart lady. And after you've done it a few times, 
like Jyotish when he was here this last weekend, says, you know this brings you pain and then you choose another way. Yeah, because it's kind of simple. Yeah, this is painful. Yeah. However, why, I don't have the Gita in front of me, why does mankind again and again, even though he knows that it's going to cause him pain, go to his own destruction? Arjuna asked Krishna. Desire, anger, attachment, again and again, the primordial feeling gets all mucky. Maya. Yeah, delusion has its own attractive power and it persuades us that we have to relate to it. That's the, that, that phrase has helped me. It persuades us that we have to relate to it. Well, I'm having all these thoughts and feelings and it persuades us that we have to relate to them instead of just doing something to shift our consciousness so we can remember that, yeah, they're there. And yeah, you know, I don't have to be ashamed of them or anything like that, but I don't really have to spend a lot of time with them either. They can just amuse themselves in the corner, you know. I'll just p- toss them a sop and just let them sort of do what they have to do. And then sometimes they just intrude themselves so strongly you have to deal with them. But again, that's not suppression, that's not fear, that's not denial, that's just saying, yeah, why would I go there? It's not really any fun. It's like you're walking down the street and you can go and have a really good Italian-style pizza or you can have a really crummy pizza. Well, I think I'll just go and have the good one. You know, it's just a better, it's a better choice coarse, refined, or something in between. (laughs) All right? Okay. So now we're up to 420, which has no comment. The individual mind cannot both perceive and be perceived simultaneously. Hmm. Hmm. There's number 421. (laughs) I really... Swami didn't have anything to say about that in... I'm a bit at a loss, too. If anybody has any great ideas, I'll hear them. We'll hear them. Give him the microphone. Oh, let's read the next one, then. If the complete cognition of one mind by another were possible, one would have to postulate an infinite number of such cognizing minds resulting in a mixture of memories. If the complete cognition (laughs) of one mind by another were possible, one would have to postulate an infinite number of such cognizing minds resulting in a mixture of memories. And then he says, such perfect cognition is possible only in the Atman, the one source of all awareness. I have a question mark by both of these and not a lot of comments. Give Tandava the microphone because he's often really good at unraveling these. This is, um, you know, so, so the commentary says such perfect cognition is possible only in the Atman. When the spirit is one, obviously the infinite consciousness can perceive all of itself, but when it breaks up into all the little bits to enjoy itself through many, for whatever reason it does, all those little bits have to think they're separate, otherwise you don't have this whole uh, lila of delusion yes, going right. on. And therefore, you know, by the time they get to the point where they can fully perceive everything, well, boom, they've merged back into God. That's good. <laughs> if the complete cognition of one bond by another were possible, one would have to postulate an infinite number of such cognizing minds, resulting in a mixture of memories. Do you have any suggestions there? Resulting well, in I mean, if you could memories? perfectly cognize another mind, you would know its memories. Yeah. And so if you had all these happening all together, it's just saying like, by the time it gets that perfect, everything's becoming one and just merging. That works for me. I can go on from that. It's good enough for Patanjali. It's yeah. <laughs> anyone else? Does anyone else need more than that? Uh-huh. Number 20 says, the individual mind cannot both perceive and be perceived simultaneously. You watch your thought. Okay. And so no matter what thought you have, there's still some part of you that watches. And so it doesn't matter what thought you have, Uh it's not you. Right, that's true. And you can be the witness, no matter how bizarre the thought is. Uh Okay, that, that works. I'll take that. Pardon me, it's a lifesaver sometimes, exactly. Okay, and the others? Um, Mirella has something back here to contribute. 
uh, perhaps one could uh, see it in such a way that the individual mind receives the information through the senses. And these senses are not really real. So it doesn't really, uh, it does not really perceive what is really true. Hmm. That's a very interesting thought too. Hmm. In P.G. Woodhouse, at this point, if we quote that famous line, we say, when we want to distract everyone from what's going on, we say, we will now sing the school song. <laughs> That's from a P.G. Woodhouse story. So, we don't have to sing the school song, but let's take a break, okay? <laughs> Okay, here we are again. Everyone ready? We're on 422. The consciousness of the self never changes, but when its reflection appears in the mind, the mind is illuminated with individual intelligence. It is like reflections of the one moon in many pots of water. The moon reflected there is one and the same, but the individual reflections may vary according to the size of the pot, the color of the water, and whether wind is blowing on the water. So though although all of us so although all of us are animated by the same divine consciousness, many factors affect the manifestation of that consciousness in each one of us. Our good, bad, and upwardly or downwardly activating qualities the clarity of our intelligence, our desires and attachments, the strength of our dependence on ego, etc. Isn't this a great one? It's like we've made it through those others and now we get this one where we can really understand it a little bit better. I think that image of one moon reflected in many pots of water is so, it's just so vivid. You can just, as soon as you say that, you can, it just gives you this entire picture of, of singularity and variety all at the same time. And how also we become so involved in the pot that we're in and however the moon is reflecting in our particular pot that we just lose track of the fact that it is not in itself the reality or the source. But, and, and then again, even more, if we perceive that, that reflection in so many others, that it's just very hard to remember that this is not the reality or the source, that it's here. And, and you know, one way I, I used to think about this, it's not quite exactly the same image, but as if the whole world, which it is, is sort of made of shiny reflective material. And when you see, if you shine a light on a piece of reflective material, the light appears to emanate from that point. And, and you look at it, and it's reflective, and it's attractive, and you reach for it. And even by its very nature, you're, you, it's a little bit hard to grasp. You can't quite figure it out, but it continues to be illuminated. And you just keep reaching, and that's how we live in this world. We keep reaching. We reach for, you know, for money, for success, for comfort, for sensuality, for food, for fiction, for, you know, anything like that. We're just always reaching because it seems so. It, it appears to be the source of light because it's reflecting it. But we don't recognize that the source is the opposite direction. The exact opposite direction, that's where we need to go. I've often thought, just trying to explain the unexplainable, but, but what is the consciousness of a master? What is the consciousness of an avatar? Because they come into the same world and they see the same things and they have to deal with the same things. But from the beginning of master's incarnation, he didn't reach for what was out in front of him. He just simply turned his back and went for the source. And you're still living in the world. You're still dealing with everything that's here. You're still following through. I mean, an avatar has no karma, but he has to follow through his mission. And he's participating completely in this world, but he never mistakes the reflection for the source. And that's how we, if we are wise, or the extent to which we are wise, we can still participate. We can be creative, we can love, we can have family, we can have responsibility, but we never 
mistake the reflection for the source. So it comes back to where we've been this whole time, isn't it? Where is your energy in the spine? What vibration are you emanating and therefore what thoughts are you attracting? And it, it reconciles the whole question of how to live and how to be. It's just all a matter of whether we, whether we know what the source is. And it, you know, it's a very, very demanding teaching because if the source is that light, and then we discover more that it's not even out there, it's emanating from us, and we'll experience it to the extent that we emanate it, really. We allow ourselves to be a clear window for that. That's how much we'll experience. Because then, in fact, we project it. And it is reflected back on us. It's reflected back on us in everything that happens. And, but we never mistake the reflection for the source. We realize that we are the source. We, meaning the Atman, the infinite I, that's the source of everything. And therefore, I see it reflected back at me from everywhere. It takes goodness to see goodness, we say. Or conditions are always neutral. Whether we perceive them as happy or sad depends on what we're projecting toward them, doesn't it? Whether we see things as ugly or beautiful, as depressing or just simply God's play, as frightening or affirming our faith depends on what we're putting forward. Because there is only one source and we just distort it or we don't distort it. It's just, again, it's one of those just marvelously liberating ideas. However, it takes away everything. <laughs> just takes away everything takes away attachment, takes away desire, or it, it takes away the justification for it. And when it is removed from us, it takes away all possibility of anything but surrender. Doesn't mean we'll take, go down lightly, but ultimately we have no choice. And that's what happens to us finally on the spiritual path. And sometimes it's very annoying. You know, it's very annoying because you just realize there's, darn it, there's just no solution except the solution. And you find all those little vrittis just agitating like crazy for an alternative. There's got to be an alternative to this, but there isn't. That's why, <laughs> that's why there aren't that many people in our church. <laughs> They're not stupid. <laughs> they see what we're, we're driving at here, and many of them want none of it. They just really don't. Just, they just don't. It's as simple as that. But, but you can't always tell how people live. I was just remembering as I was saying that. There's a couple in our church, and she used to come a lot, and he, uh, he would occasionally come to a party or something. Very wealthy man. Self-made, good man. Well, relatively good man. Self-made, hardworking, etc. Made lots of money, loved to spend it. Great indulger, very sensual person. He basically thought, if there's no sex in the astral world, I'm not interested. <laughs> I mean, it was just incomprehensible to him that life could be enjoyable if there was no sex. I mean, that was just basically the way he viewed things. But that man was a strong man. Maybe he was 50, and he was out running, and he had a pain in his back that wouldn't go away. He went to have himself uh, examined. He was, his spine was riddled with cancer. He went into the hospital from his track, in his track suit, he went into the hospital. They found him cancer up and down his spine. He never came out of the hospital. He died there about two weeks later. He died with complete equanimity. So you just, you know, you just don't know, just complete equanimity. It was like, well, it's been a great run, meaning I've had a great life. Couldn't have asked for anything more. Now it's over, okay. I mean, so it's just, it's not always what you're doing or what you're saying. It's really where you're getting your energy, what you think is the source, who you really are inside. We can't become dogmatic and sectarian and prissy about this. It really doesn't serve us to be prissy. Sometimes, you know, people who put on the best show, put on a show, are not as strong as people who are living authentically but with power. You know, that man had real power. And when it really came down to it, he just lifted up his hands and said goodbye and just went off as well as a man could go off. Interesting, isn't it? Big lesson. I'd always liked him because you could feel it. And he was just childish in his worldliness. He said to me once, 
when he was 11, his mother found the Playboy magazines under his mattress. And his, his mother said to him, oh, honey, I was hoping you'd be a little older before this started. <laughs> that was her response. And he said, Mom, show me something more interesting and I'll look at that. <laughs> but he was just, you know, he was just out there, shameless in a certain sense. This is, this is who I am. This is what I love. But there was, you see, there was a certain um, humility in that. You know, something to be overcome eventually. But, but he was just free and a certain level, much freer than many people. Of course, he had a ways to go. I'm not doing to make him too glorious. But still, it was very impressive and a very uh, good lesson. Yeah. So, anyone else? There was a, let's see, there was a psychic woman who used to, uh, commune, you know, she was a, 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 tr- a trance. She could talk to people on the other side. And she spoke about her own lives and she said, let's see, in one life she was a complete tramp and she just lived at the seaport and, and slept with every sailor who came into town. The next life she was a very judgmental nun. Now she said she was a happy medium. <laughs> Actually, I mean, that was a woman who actually said that. <laughs> that wasn't just a joke. That was from, that was from a happy medium. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or comments about the moon reflected in the pots? All right. Yes. Uh, give him the microphone, please. Remember, remember when Kamala was living in the community mm-hmm. years Kamala ago? Kamala Silva. Uh-huh. Kamala Silva. I think there was a little story, and I think you're... Something had happened, and you maybe it was you made some comment or another. And Swami said, "Oh, Asha, it's just her mind." No, that was because she was um, she had age age related mm-hmm. dementia. Yeah. Whether she had Alzheimer's or not, I don't know. But she was definitely she did not have an intellectual capacity anymore, mm-hmm. and um, she was. We were taking care of her in the community. This was Master's devoted disciple, and to me, it was just really scary. You know, the Swami, she's lost, Swami said she's lost her mind. I said, she's lost her mind? And Swami said, well, Asha, it's just her mind. And I just was like, but it's her mind. <laughs> it was very unsettling to me until I met her. And it, it was, it's, I mean, then later my own uh, father went through a similar state in the last two years of his life. And, but that hadn't happened yet. But it was so amazing because when you met her, it was so clear that all she'd lost was her mind, and she didn't need it. She, she did not have her intellectual capacity when, I, when David and I were introduced to her. She said, tell me your names, I'll forget them immediately, but tell them to me anyway. And just, you know, she just didn't have anything like that, and she really, well, at times she did, but later on she didn't really even know where she was. And I'm told as she got more into it, she, she'd always loved animals, and she thought her stuffed animals were real. And when she looked out the window of the uh, assisted living facility where she ended up, just an ugly parking lot, she thought she was in the Himalayas. Yeah, but she was very, very joyful. And she remembered that she was a disciple of Master. And she remembered Master very clearly. But she just didn't have all the rest of it. But when you saw her, you really realized, who needs the rest of it? Really? We think we need it. Now, of course it made her incapable of taking care of herself. There were certain practical implications. She needed somebody completely to take care of her because she lost the ability to do that. But that's really a rather minor skill compared to being in in the awareness of the spirit in a happy heart. My father was not spiritually minded at all, but in the last couple of years of his life, his mental, he'd been a a very intelligent man with a very... um, Virgo attitude. You know, he was always analyzing things and pulling out little pieces of them. And uh, he just lost all of it. And he just became so sweet because he couldn't remember what he was worried about anymore. Prior to that, he had to worry about a lot of things all the time. And he had to feel responsible and he had to take care of stuff and he had to make sure that we were all in line and that everybody understood the implications of everything. 
which he was still a very nice man, but when he couldn't do that anymore, he just became a really nice man. Just so sweet from his heart, so appreciative, so sort of childlike in his enthusiasms, and and he couldn't take care of himself at all. (laughs) They they called me once. Um, (laughs) This was so fun. The staff person, you know, they they never know what they're going to get when they call the family, so the staff person calls the family. The conversation starts like this. We called poison control, and it's not a problem. Uh huh. So what do we? Do? Why did we call poison control? Because <laughs> my dad was sitting at the table, and somebody took their eyes off him, and he ate the flower arrangement. <laughs> 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 because it was on the table, you know, and he couldn't tell. <laughs> but they'd cause called poison control, and it was no problem. <laughs> I began to laugh. So when I began to laugh, the staff person began to laugh too because I'm sure they had all laughed about it. But You know, he didn't have much of a sense of taste anymore and so on. So he just, you know, there was, yeah, there was porridge, there was fruit, there were flowers. He just ate them all. <laughs> but what difference did it make? He, was a, he, he just was very sweet and very happy and he died very joyfully. And, and he was a favorite because he was just so dear. And the last words he said were, thank you. Somebody gave him something and he said, thank you, and he never spoke again. So who needs a mind? I mean, I like mine, but if it goes, it goes. Questions? Did you have a comment over there? Okay. All right. So now we're going to go to 423. The citta understands everything according to how it is affected by its own nature and by what it sees. The citta understands everything according to how it is affected by its own nature and by what it sees. Primordial feeling. We like this word, primordial feeling. Colored by who is seeing and by what is seen. Reacts accordingly. That feeling is the true determiner of our degree of awareness. If a bitter taste affects one negatively, its perception of that object, a fruit, for example, will be negative. Okay, so that's in primordial feeling, colored by who is seeing and by what is seen, reacts accordingly. That feeling is the true determinator, determiner of our degree of awareness. If a bitter taste affects one negatively, its perception of that object will be negative. You know, thinking again, of it, actually, when, when I had to take care of my parents toward the end of their lives, and when my mother died, physic, was sick physically, and then my father a little mentally, and then afterwards I had an aunt and uncle on the East Coast that I ended up also helping, and he was 95 when he died, she was 89. But I, I, I got very interested in how much you could learn from aging elderly people especially elderly people whose bodies or minds were in, you know, not prime condition anymore. Because you could really begin to see the difference between consciousness and mind, between personality and essence, and just the way people, things are oriented. I found it extremely stimulating. Um, Every time I had to visit, I went to visit, especially my aunt and uncle was, I, I went in a slightly different way. They lived in this big facility, and I sort of just saw lots of people, including my relatives. But it was so fascinating because you could see the essence of the person and then you could see how the, the attitude or the mind or the physical body had shrunk up a little bit and how... Um, see, what was the point I was going to say? Just the orientation of your heart, the orientation of your feelings just simply determines everything. And that, you know, that's how well, my father, to use the example, he just he was oriented to be appreciative. And so everything that he saw, he, was, he appreciated. Kamala was oriented to feel that God was loving her and that everything was beautiful. And that feeling determined how aware she was. And her awareness was really more accurate because the feeling was so um, predisposed in such a positive way. Um, I was thinking of uh, Helen's mother, actually, who was a very, very refined and really saintly lady. Helen, as you know, or may know, there were nine siblings in her family. And the whole family was held together by this wonderful mother she had. And I didn't meet her mother 
until very late in her mother's life when her mind wasn't working so well again. But she was just so still, just so refined, and had so much goodness, and, and had that same orientation. Everything to her was good. You know, she was, again, incapable of really running her own life and knew that she really wasn't. But she responded to it by considering that whatever happened was really just fine because the essential feeling inside of her was one of contentment, a life well-lived, devotion to God. Um, she'd been a very devout um, Catholic person. And just she, that was the feeling. That was what was in her. So she was, she was aware of that dimension regardless. And of course, she was very well taken care of. She had very good karma, but she'd earned it. But just to be with her, even though she really couldn't be who she had been, it was very, very uplifting to be in her company. And you could just see that. And all of us, you know, it's... Um, we, we just... We, we get these feelings about things, and then that's what we see. The fruit tastes bitter, and therefore that's an ugly fruit. I don't like it. Somebody mistreats us, therefore they're a mean person. I don't like you. We have some bad experience in some context in some lifetime, and therefore we're all oriented against that. Or we've been afraid. I had this, I mean, this is not, my own upbringing was very um, sane and very sensible and very fair. You know, very, I, was, I was brought up by really conscientious parents. A woman friend of mine was brought up by an alcoholic mother, single parent alcoholic mother. This woman wanted something from me. And it, it you know, I, I wanted to help her, but I, the details escaped me. But whatever it was she wanted me to do for her, I simply couldn't. Circumstances just wouldn't allow me to do it. And I wanted to, but I couldn't. She kept asking me, and then asking me from another angle, and then asking me again, and then asking me one more time. I finally, in exasperation, said, it's not that I don't want to, it's just that I can't. Why do you keep asking me? And it kind of you know, startled her and brought her out of it again. She basically explained that her mother, which was her primary upbringing, was so random in her responses that she had never, you know, no response was fixed and no response was sensible. And so her, her way of making her way through her upbringing was if you wanted something, you just kept going because you never knew what would suddenly turn the tide in your favor. There was no rational conversation and no way to appraise it reasonably afterwards. And it was just so interesting. And so a lot of people, we look damaged by our upbringings, let's say, but of course you're born into that incarnation because it's going to orient you toward whatever the lessons are that you need to learn. I was, what happened to me, even though I was raised rationally, is I was, one, I was raised too intellectually, and two, I, I, I was raised as a snob, <laughs> as an intellectual snob. So, but I chose it. I wanted that because I needed to push that karma far enough. Because what happens is, you see, we don't give up karma. I, I, I was so confused by that. Why wasn't I born into something that would have balanced that fault? Why was I born instead into something that exacerbated that fault in me? And then it just occurred to me, because I hadn't suffered enough from it. And I needed it to get worse. Because only when the suffering caused by our ignorance is worse than the imagined difficulty of changing, will we actually put out the energy to change. And if you think about it, that's a pretty high level of suffering as a rule. So we, we tend to get going in a certain direction and we keep incarnating in ways that will just keep pushing it. So I incarnated into an intellectual Jewish family in which, excuse me, you could get to be one of the chosen people. <laughs> and not only were you smart, but you were selected by God. <laughs> one of my friends, one of my friends who grew up in that culture worse, worse, was a freshman in college. She'd gone to some really good college, and she was, but it wasn't Brandeis. It wasn't a, or and it wasn't in Tel Aviv. It was just somewhere. She's sitting in this room, you know, the first night. She's looking around the room, and she's aware of the fact that most of the people in the room are not Jewish. It crossed her mind that they'd all been smart enough to get into this school. <laughs> and that was the first crack in the sort of cultural bias that she'd lived with her whole life. 
I love it. Isn't that fantastic? But you know, that's, you, you get oriented that way. So if you grow up in a household where things are chaotic, it's not that you're being punished. It's just that these, this is the necessary karmic conditions that's required to push you to the point where you will become determined to balance yourself, whatever that, it doesn't always work neatly, but some way it works somehow or another. There are no mistakes. It's all metaphysics. It's, that's tough. That's why there aren't that many people in our church. <laughs> that's it. There aren't so, yeah. Okay. Any other comments on this? Or else, if not, we have reached the end of our time. Okay. Can I have a pen from someone so I don't have to try to figure this out later? Thank you. That's it. So we finished. We went from 418 to 423. That was a lot. We covered a lot of turf. Okay, so that's the end of class number 66. Okay, next week. Then we skip a week. I mean, if we don't finish next week, which we probably won't. But if we don't, then uh, we skip a week because I'm going to be in New York for a week. And then we come back the last Tuesday in June and we will definitely finish or we will just stay here until we do. It's just simply that. <laughs> Say again? Well, you all can leave, but I'll just talk into the camera until it's over. Yeah, yeah bring snacks, blankies, and, and stuffies, okay? <laughs> I've always wanted to have a slumber party in here, so we can do that. Okay. Okay.